Hey, Joe, this is Amy. Can you hear me okay? Thank you.
Okay, thank you, Amy. Can you hear me? Very good, thank you. Welcome, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Doug Erlin, and I'm the director of the North Carolina Institute for Public Health. And we certainly appreciate your time and attention this afternoon being in the crisis leadership of primer uh, session for us today. Uh, we're, as we go on, we're going to be able to talk about crisis leadership with you. We've got lots of interactive pieces, so we hope that you're uh, able to participate in that way with us today. And certainly, I know that we're all working through this process of technology, and so we're hopeful that all the technology maintains appropriately today. But uh, we'll roll with it uh, should we have any kind of other issues or what have you. We do want to absolutely say thank you. Uh, as we look at uh, the crisis leadership and the, the funding opportunities for us in the next slide. And that is for our great partners, the North Carolina uh, AHEC. They have been great uh, partners with us throughout the years. They continue to be, and certainly for this session as well. And so we're certainly pleased to be able to use the development of the training provided by this, this funding. And we certainly do appreciate that. As I said, I'm Doug Erlin, the director of the NCIPH at the UNC Gillings School of Public Health, and I'll ask Amy to introduce herself as well. <laughs> Sorry about that. I was going to go on ahead. Sure. Um, toggling between three students trying to unmute. Yes, I'm Amy Belflower Thomas. Um, I'm lucky to work as well as with the North Carolina Institute of Public for Public Health, and I serve as our director for community assessment and strategy. Thank you, Amy. So we, again, appreciate your time today. We look forward to working with you this afternoon, and we hope you keep you energized and so forth. We know it's uh, the end of a long day, and you all are very busy, certainly, with COVID-19 and other issues. So uh, this training will cover characteristics, certainly, of crisis leadership. Uh, we'll also have the strategies to influence stakeholders, and then those six phases of trying to manage a crisis. And again, many of you are in the midst of that right now. Next slide. Thank you. So the training series that we're talking about is Crisis Leadership, a primer, but we've got some others uh, that we want to certainly bring to your attention as well in terms of crisis communication. Again, more than what it said, uh, six phases to managing a crisis, self and employee care during a crisis. And I think that certainly is of uh, paramount um, importance these days uh, and knowing that uh, National Mental Health Day is this Saturday. Uh, so I think that's certainly to be uh, to be thought about, not just during this time, but other times of crises. And then certainly the, the high stakes leadership, you know, leading with that fortitude and that judgment and the confidence uh, to make decisions, to be engaged and to try to uh, affect uh, a leadership a leadership stance while you're working in a crisis. The um, information today and content is generally adapted from a couple of really great books. One is uh, from Bruce, Bruce Blythe. Uh, he's the uh, a series of leadership books that he's written. Uh, he's certainly widely worked and engaged in many crises. Uh, and certainly think you'll find Blindsided important and a good and a good read and lots of good content. And then also Crisis Leadership, and that's from uh, certainly our friends and many of you are aware of the uh, great leadership group, the Center for Creative Leadership in Greensboro. Uh, they have a stellar reputation for providing leadership training and so forth. And this is, again, another great resource. Thanks. So for the expectations, as I mentioned earlier, and you saw it in the chat already, uh, that we want you to participate as much as possible. Obviously, we're in a virtual world for this conference. Uh, so if we were face to face, it might be a little easier. However, we're hopeful that this technology will work for you in this realm, and then you'll be able to engage with us. So at, at times throughout this, we do want your opinion and your thoughts. Uh, and I do appreciate also, I saw Hugh Tilson has just joined us from the from North Carolina AHEC and really do appreciate again you being part of this and that AHEC's helping to to make this curriculum and make this session happen today. So thank you very much. As we continue, uh, I'll be handing it over to Amy momentarily, but to keep this in mind that for crisis leadership, no matter what your role or position in an organization, you can always be a leader. It doesn't it doesn't hinge upon what your badge says or what your title says uh, in a classification or somewhere in an HR realm, but we all can be leaders and we can all be teachers and learners no matter what our role. So keep that in mind today as you go through this training and, uh, and engage with us again. And we do appreciate your time and I will now 
uh, pass it over to Amy. Thank you, Amy. Great. Thanks, Doug. Yeah, so um, some of you guys may have missed it when we started. Um, we'll open that poll back up. But before we get started, too, we just want to kind of assess what's your level of experience leading during a crisis? So this poll now should be open. So if you go to the same um, polled everywhere address at the very top, or it's also, Joe has put it right there um, in the chat as well. If you just want to click on that, just get a feel for kind of levels of experience with leading in a crisis in the room. I love it when the, when the data starts coming in. <laughs> Keep it coming. All right. Yeah. All right. So this may keep on moving a little bit, but yeah, we seem to have hit two different places, right? So um, looks like we have some people who admit that they have some experience, right? But maybe it's not extensive. And then some people who have no experience leading in a crisis. So I think what this shows us is that we have a broad level experience in the group today. Okay, and some who have experience, but limited experience. And so as Doug says, we do want you to participate. And I wish there was a way we could open up mics so we could have more of a discussion. That's how we really wanted to frame this. But please use the chat um, as much as you can. And it's important to hear from everybody, both people who don't have any experience, who can ask certain questions, but then also those of you who are in the room who have some experience. This is very much built upon, we use a lot of examples from COVID. And so you guys have been leading during this for the past six months. And so we wanna hear from you. We want this to be interactive. Um, and we want those of you who do have experience to be able to show and demonstrate some of the things you've learned with people who maybe don't have experience. So. Good, we'll just keep this in mind as we go through. Thank you for participating. All right, so we're gonna start with characteristics of crisis leadership. And I'll say too, if you have any questions or comments, um, feel free to put those in the chat as we go along, because this is gonna be interactive and I'll be keeping an eye on those as well. So let's start at the very beginning in defining crisis leadership, um, kind of as to set the stage of how we're gonna be using the term throughout the training. So the word crisis um, originates from the Greek for crisis, which means to sift or to separate. So when you look at it that way, a crisis has the potential to divide an organization's past from its future, to re replace things like security with insecurity, and to separate effective leaders from ineffective ones. And unfortunately, a crisis has the potential to swap kind of routine things we do every day for creativity, and it can shift an organization from business as usual into significant change. And I think that's the important thing to point out here is that lots of times when we hear the word crisis, we think emergency, we think almost in the negative, right? We get kind of stressed out about it. It's not, it's not a term that we hear and it relaxes us, right? But crises do present an opportunity for us to kind of shift from that routine to the creative and to really make some change and drive some change in our organizations and in the work we do. And so it's important to keep that in mind um, to kind of think about that positive spin as well. So many of you have already experienced how the COVID crisis has caused the way we in our communities do business to change and shift. And there are certainly specific characteristics of a crisis and the way they bring about change which is what causes these leadership challenges. And we also wanna point out that a crisis can be both professional and personal. So here we're talking a lot about COVID and we're, we're gonna focus in this training on professional crises that face organizations and public health in general. But remember that many of these same lessons apply and you can bring the lessons learned from this and experience with personal crises to professional ones and vice versa. So one more poll. So. One word, just one word. I know it's tough. So again, go to this, the exact same poll everywhere and give us one word. And we're going to have a word cloud to describe a personal or professional crisis. So we talked about COVID is one example. What other examples can you think of for um, different examples of a crisis? Yep, we've got flood. And you can put more than one. Keep on putting them in there. What this is going to do is, is put together a word cloud for us. So if things are repeated, they're going to come up more prominently. Yeah, so I like this. As you can see, this is coming around. We're getting some of the physical things like floods and hurricanes, but then we're getting some descriptions like debilitating, right? That's interesting. Yeah, and then into the personal, right? We see divorce there, right? Good, so people are thinking some, of some personal ones too. Uh-oh, hurricane's getting big. <laughs> Outbreaks, right? 
Funding, oh, that can be a crisis quite often, huh? That's a continuing crisis, seems to be. Funding and budgets. Reactive, I see that too. Another kind of description of sometimes how crises are. I don't know if, fund, if funding and death are, okay, they're separate. Funding and death, not the same. All right. Yeah, and you see things like stressful, accountability, sure, harassment, burnout. So again, some of those descriptions of crises. All right. Salmonella, sure, certainly. <laughs> right, and just like I talked about, normally when we think about a crisis, some of these things are either, you know, examples of crises, but a lot of the feelings and the descriptors you guys are using are pretty negative, right? Exhausting. Absolutely. You're experiencing that now. All right. So we're going to move ahead. That was great. And hurricane and funding, I think, went out here. Thank you for participating. You had some really some really good examples. So I think we have a good idea about kind of the the full um description of what a crisis is, but also what it feels like, what our, our first impression when we think about a crisis is. So it's important to realize that crises are not usually expected or planned for. So I think you know, when we think about COVID, certainly we've known in public health for a long time that a pandemic is, is going to happen, right? Um, we've been planning for pandemic flu a little bit more than others, but we kind of always knew that this was going to happen, but certainly not when, what, and how. So definitely ex unexpected, unplanned for. Crises also frighten and stun those on whom it falls. And usually their signs or indications were ignored or planning was put on the back burner or wished away. And so, again, those of us working in public health can probably remember kind of that preparedness and response funding wave of years ago. Um, where we did a lot of planning and things like that. And then our infrastructure and our funding has decreased. Um, and so even though we knew a pandemic was imminent of some sort or another, um, you know, it's kind of been backburnered a little bit, at least as, as for funding and prioritization, right? And lastly, a crisis can exert a high impact on human needs, emotions, and behaviors. And so it's not always about the physical manifestations of a crisis. Lots of times it's about the emotions and the behaviors and the human needs around that crisis that require most of our response and require that true leadership. So let's take a look at one of the organizational crises you identified before in the word cloud for which you likely have plenty of recent experience. So let's take the COVID um, pandemic. So just put some, some thoughts in the chat about how you think the COVID-19 pandemic meets these characteristics of a crisis or maybe how it didn't. So I talked about a couple. Any thoughts that you guys have about how COVID meets these or maybe it for some reasons doesn't meet these? I'll wait a few minutes and let some people type in the chat. Yeah, Kathy Brooks says, yeah, it hits all the bullet points. <laughs> I think it does in many ways, yeah. Doug, while people are, are typing in, um, with your experience as a former local health director and your public health experience, any um, comments you have on this? I think I was I was typing, and I'm not as fast of a, a typist as other folks, and I was going to say all those characteristics for COVID, yeah. and certainly that's been validated by what folks have put in the chat. But uh, one thing I would jump into right away in those, in those uh, characteristics is high impact, high impact on human needs, of course, emotions, behaviors of everyone. We know that while you may not yourself um, have contracted the disease to this point, you n either know someone that has or it's been so disruptive. So it really has had that impact on our entire way of life, not just from a professional uh, perspective, but personal as well. All right. Thank you. All right. So moving on, leadership has really been defined as the ability to influence others, right? And influencing techniques that are effective during normal times become even more critical during a crisis. And we're going to touch back on this throughout the training quite a few times that really leadership in general is very much about influencing others. But in a crisis that becomes even more important with the messages that you have to convey. Um, we know this in public health and some of us who work a lot in health behavior that you can't just tell somebody 
to do something right and to you know quit smoking like you have to influence them you have to find ways to convince them besides just telling them the right thing to do and so we need to keep this in mind as we as we talk about crisis leadership and so when we talk about crisis leadership we really are talking about influencing other people who may be scared or stunned during the crisis because something is un has unexpectedly happened, right? And that really, again, goes back to exerting a high impact on human needs. And so as we think about crisis leadership, we can think about this quote, I think. Um, and I think this really describes and sums up the message perfectly. Leadership may be hard to define, but in times of crisis, it is easy to identify. So you, did, you guys did a very good job of talking about what crisis leadership is, right? And you, you said it in a couple of, you said it in one word and describing um, a crisis. And then the beginning of the session, we had you describe what crisis leadership is to you. Um, but I think as we think back on, on COVID and in many different ways, uh, many different partners and organizations and level, levels of government, there may have been times that you're like, yeah, things are going okay. Yeah, I think they're leading pretty well, but you probably recognize more the time when leadership was not going well. Um, it's really easy to identify when leadership is not going well during a crisis. And so again, it's really about that ability to influence others. Um, and that's even more important in that time of crisis. So this is going back to the beginning of the session. And for those of you who um, took the poll about defining crisis leadership in five words or fewer. And so um, don't sweat the small stuff. I think that makes sense. Steering a ship in a storm. We hear that, that metaphor quite a lot with crisis leadership. Getting priorities done though untidy. Yeah, we're gonna get back to that about the importance of sometimes just making a decision with less information than maybe you feel comfortable with to do so. Transparent communication and rapid adaptation. Absolutely, we're gonna talk about that flexibility and needing to almost over communicate during a crisis. Helping teammates be their best. I like this one a lot too, because leadership is, especially crisis leadership, is not just what you do as a leader. And as Doug said, we're talking about not only the top leaders of organizations, but your ability to lead across your organization and even up in your organization during a crisis. And it's really about helping your team um, do the best they can in leading through this, right? It's not just your health director or somebody um, leading all this work during COVID, right? It's really the whole team of the health departments um, doing it. Calmly assessing options and making decisions. Yeah, we're gonna get back to that too. That making decisions is a really important one that we're gonna get back to. So yeah, y'all did some great, um, great job describing crisis leadership and really getting to the heart of it. So crisis response is a team effort, as one of you guys just said in that, in, in that poll, and their response is needed at various levels. However, when we think of crisis response, in addition to crisis leaders, we also have to think about tactical responders. And so I want to differentiate between tactical responders and crisis leaders. So as a reminder, a tactical responder reacts to issues as they arise, they have a short-term focus and they're process oriented. They have that very narrow focus to get the job done and they implement these, ta these tactical type tasks. And the importance of this is, is that we all have these sorts of people in our organizations, but a lot of us in public health um, are doers, right? We don't have five administrative assistants to, do our, to help us do our jobs or anything like that. Lots of the times we just we have to do the work at hand and we hold a million hats and we're used to just getting the work done. But what's really important when you're needing to exhibit crisis leadership is that you have to step away a little bit from this tactical and this task based perspective to get more into a crisis leadership frame. And that sometimes can make us a little uncomfortable. And when we get uncomfortable, we tend to shift back to our norm, which is that tactical. So we really have to focus here on anticipating what's ahead, thinking about long-term consequences and to kind of taking that, that focus, being directed by guiding principles and staying on those, having this kind of wide focus and using judgment to make decisions. And so 
I encourage you to kind of think about this. And as you're responding in a crisis, kind of just check yourself a little bit sometimes. Um, I know sometimes um, I'm a list person and I can get into that technical work mode too. Where I just want to check things off on a list. But that's getting a really narrow focus and focusing on these tasks when sometimes you really need to think in this broader kind of this meta leadership. If you heard um, Vaughn Upshaw's discussion um, that's kind of similar to this about leading um, during times of uncertainty, that really taking this more all encompassing meta leadership type approach is really important. So let's think about what we've discussed a little bit so far with COVID-19 and the pandemic. In what ways, and again, I'm going to rely on you guys to put some stuff in the chat. In what ways did it require you as a leader or leaders you know to be more crisis or leader oriented versus this tactical responder piece? And how do you think that's different than the ordinary for you? I discussed this a little bit, but I'd love to hear some, some real life examples you may have. So feel free to, to just jot those in the chat. So any comments on kind of the, the crisis leader approach versus the tactical? And Doug, it'd be great if you could jump in too. So one of the things, Amy, as folks I know are going to be typing in there um, mm -hmm. is what you mentioned, and certainly to reiterate that, and that is the um, the wanting to respond. And of course, even uh, right af after 9-11, public health as a whole field and discipline really was thrust into that realm and being classified as a first responder uh, and responding to acts of bioterrorism and so forth. And I think part of that with public health and even, it w even more broadly in human services, many people are wired to and they're attracted to the field because they want to help people, no matter what that is. Perhaps your field is nursing or health education and promotion or perhaps environmental health. But I think it's generally a sense of wanting to help and be involved and engage and, and help someone's life be better or community be better. And with that, sometimes comes in the realm of in a crisis where you want to come in and try to fix something or address something straight on. And perhaps in a leadership role, you got to check yourself, take a step back and say, you know, is that where I need, is that where the organization, my community needs me right now? Where do they really need me to be? And how can we make sure that that issue that I've identified is addressed, but that perhaps it's someone else within the organization, or if you're going through your, your EOC or your incident command, someone else in a role can address those needs. Right. Yeah, I think that's really important too. Yeah, sometimes in, in, our, in our public health kind of stance to, to help, um, we can kind of uh, revert back to, to our tactical approach. I think that's a really good point. Any other thoughts from the group? Y'all are great at responding to the polls. And I've been so happy to see that participation. And I know sometimes it's hard to, to convey longer thoughts in the chat. But um, even if you if you miss this opportunity to put something in the chat, um, just any thoughts you guys have or experiences you have that are important to point out, please go ahead and write those in the chat. Um, I really wish we could interact with you guys more verbally. But the more we can, I can kind of rephrase things and examples you have, the better. All right, so crisis leadership um, really depends on personal skills, trains and traits and perspectives of the leader. So thinking about your response to COVID-19, what is your reaction to this statement? So crisis leadership is more about who you are than what you know. This time I'm gonna flip it on you guys and I'm not gonna talk about this statement, I'm gonna leave it for you. Um, but I will point out that Pam, Pam Brown had a good point about um, the differentiation. And sometimes, yes, Pam, good point. That sometimes you have to do the tactical and the crisis leadership at, at both at once. Yeah, we don't exactly have um, uh, the ability in public health sometimes with our funding and our infrastructure, right, to just be a thought leader or just be a crisis leader. We have to do the do, too. So that's a very good point. So, yeah, what do you guys think about, about this statement? It's more about who you are than what you know. Do you think that just taking this, this two hour course today and getting the knowledge and knowing something is enough? Or do you think that there's certain kind of innate, uh, skills and not only skills, but um, 
perspectives and values that we have in public health um, that maybe uh, are relatable to crisis leadership. So yeah, Candace, I totally buy that one can be a good leader without having all the subject matter expertise. Yep. And having the expertise doesn't make one a great leader. And Kathy agreed. If you have the knowledge, who you are will make you respond differently in a crisis than in your everyday work. Absolutely. And Tammy, true leadership is about who you really are and how you naturally react to situations. Yeah. And sometimes in a crisis, what is unknown often trumps the known. That's very true. Yep. And in a crisis, we tend to pull from our own coping mechanisms. So practicing what we preach and modeling, right, very important. Yeah. And Doug brings up a really good point, too, that especially during a crisis, you can tell when people are leading authentic, authentically or not. Um, and I think that gets to the who you are part, too. Um, people know if you're not being authentic. Um, and we're going to talk in a little bit. We're going to show a couple of examples of some people who have demonstrated some leadership um, during the COVID crisis. And some of them are crazy good experts um, in science and public health. But that's not why they come off um, as approachable and trusted by the public. It's more about who they are and how that they communicate um, and how they work with people and how authentic they are about, about caring about people as well. Yeah. And Gene, too, it's, about, it's a lot about who you are internally. You can't cover that up. Right. Um, or you can try, but it may not last very long. And certainly experience has a lot to do with this. So um, I think Dr. Cohen mentioned this um, in her introduction yesterday. But, you know, as, as frustrating and as, as stressed as we are in response to the COVID pandemic, we as public health workers are going through a pandemic that we haven't dealt with. Um, and it's going to give so much great experience for us to think about how to do things better in the future. Right. And so as much as we can, learning from this experience so we can respond better in the future is what it's really all about. Yeah. Good points. Great. Y'all. OK. Y'all are in the chatting now. I'm going to keep you there. Keep you in that lane. Thank you. So let's consider how the following skills, traits and perspectives have on a leader's ability to influence. So personal example. So um, somebody talked about kind of modeling, right? All of us tend to have a tendency to mimic the behavior of people whom we respect, regardless of their official position. So effective leaders leverage this tendency and all leaders would benefit from becoming more aware of the significant impact of their words and that their actions have on others. And sometimes this is apparent, but other times it's important not only when you're a leader, but when you're exhibiting crisis leadership and when you're in a crisis to actually proactively solicit some feedback from others. And maybe during a crisis, that's not the time to do it. But for soliciting some feedback on your leadership and your communication, your modeling when you're not in a crisis is a really good way to assess how others perceive and respond to the example you set. So you may feel like the way you're modeling is effective, but in talk to, until you talk to other people, um, you don't really know. And perceptions are important. You may have the best of intentions with the way you model um, and you show authenticity. But if it's not coming off that way and other people are perceiving it differently, um, then it's not resonating and you need to change something to be more effective. And then you have to think about character. Um, and so, you know, I know there's always this debate and we won't get into a political debate today about politicians and what's more important, the work they do, or does their character have something to do um, uh, with our ability to, to trust them to be a leader? But at a minimum, character implies telling the truth, being consistent in what we do and doing what we say, treating people with dignity, avoiding actions that even hint at impropriety, and exercising self-control in the areas of morality and self-indulgence. And so I won't go into this too much more in the middle of a political year, but I think you can make some parallels here and think about the importance of character and, and not only with, with politics right now, but also with COVID response and some of our leaders and how they've responded during COVID. Think about their character and how much that kind of um, influences your ability to trust them on important issues like getting the vaccine or taking protective measures. And then there's competence. Leaders should be technically capable, of course, of handling their positions. Um, but that's even more obvious if they are or they aren't 
during a crisis. And so nothing can really multiply the anxieties um, that people already have during a crisis or reduce their confidence during a crisis more than a leader who's perceived to be only marginally competent, right? And so again, I think we have some examples of this with COVID too, but think about that, how that is important. And it's, it's linked a lot with character as well. And then courage. Um, leadership in general takes courage, but leading during a crisis definitely takes courage. It takes a high measure of courage to tell the truth under difficult circumstances. And we've talked how much authenticity and transparency is important, but often it's very hard in a crisis to tell people that you don't know the answer or that the answer may have changed. Um, and it's also hard to make decisions and answer tough questions um, to face people who don't believe in what you say, don't trust in what you say. Um, and also, you know, we know during COVID, especially with public health officials and, and some health departments, kind of the pushback and the resistance and even um, some violence and some threats against public health leaders um, for doing their job. Um, but these are the things that are asked of a leader during a crisis. And so courage becomes even more important. And then lastly, and we discussed this a little bit, and you guys did a great job in the five word descriptions, talking about this a couple of times, but being decisive. So during a crisis, even when a wrong decision um, promotes action, that's better than doing nothing in most cases. Influential decision making means gathering information and getting input as soon as possible, but also knowing that all the information you need to make a decision isn't gonna be available quick enough. Except that there's some risks involved in you making a decision and because of that, get some recommendations from others, listen to your gut and make a decision because it needs to be made. And then be ready to pivot and shift as you need to if that decision wasn't quite correct or more information comes in, but you have to be decisive. And so an effective crisis leader must act deliberately this is kind of following up on the last slide. They must act effectively, quickly. We talked about the decision making and ethically with honesty and high moral values. And we'll talk a little bit more about this. So here are some leaders who have been recognizable throughout the COVID-19 crisis. Um, we'll get some quick chat interaction. Does anybody know who the, the woman is and the type Top right hand corner. Does anybody know who she is? If so, throw it in the chat really quick. I don't see it really quickly, but at the top right is Dr. Angela Dunn. She's actually from Utah, state health director in Utah. And she actually, even though Utah had some conservative push against a lot of things, she pushed through the nation's earliest social distancing measures. Um, in a state um, that is pretty conservative and had some push against that. Um, she really displayed a lot of courage and um, sticking to her guns about competency and things like that. And of course, at the bottom right, I don't probably don't have to ask for um, who is here, but these are these are members from the coronavirus task force, of course, at the national level. And then, of course, we know in North Carolina, um, Governor Roy Cooper and Dr. Mandy Cohen leading our our work. And then how about at the top left? Does anybody know who that um, that woman at the at the microphone is? There's a clue in the background. <laughs> yeah, that is Dr. Amy Acton. She was actually the Ohio Department of Health director. Um, and I'm going to show you in a little bit. She has received a lot of acclaim um, for her messaging during the early days of COVID. Um, and when we're thinking about courage and what people are up against, um, Dr. Acton is no longer the state health director in Ohio um, because she resigned um, this summer because of personal threats to her and her family um, that I talked about in, in, um, a little bit earlier um, because of attacks against her and, and her family because of um, the important messages she was trying to convey about public health. So these are some examples of people who have led during this crisis with COVID. What are some of y'all's thoughts about how these leaders were effective, um, weren't effective, and maybe how they demonstrated some of the, the skills we've just discussed? So those skills about competence and um, decisiveness, uh, what are the character, there's other things we talked about. Any thoughts? I'm 
maybe we just want to stick to our state. How have you guys felt um, with communication from our governor and from Dr. Cohen? What things have they done in the press conferences and in general um, to demonstrate effectiveness? Yeah, not wavering despite public opinions. Yeah, so we, North Carolina is one of the few states that really stuck to those phase guidelines, right? Yeah, making the best decisions with what information they have. Absolutely. <laughs> of course he thinks that Dr. Tilson has done a great job. Dr. Betsy Tilson has done a fantastic job. Thanks for pointing that out too. Yeah, we have many leaders. I think North Carolina is very blessed to have the leadership we have in, in public health um, across the state. Um, I think if you look at some, especially other Southeastern states, um, we've taken a pretty staunch stance and made decisions and made decisions based on information that we have. And we know that testing data and other sorts of data are not always perfect. They're not um, always up to the minute, but you have to make decisions based on what you have and then pivot, right? So Kathy points out that Dr. Fauci has been steadfast in his messaging and standing up for what was right. Yeah, and then North Carolina both have been done, done an excellent job in being strong and effective in our response, despite criticism, right? It's really hard to take criticism. I think all of us, no matter how much of a hard shell we have, um, it's so hard to take criticism. Um, but they've done it, I think, really gracefully um, and sticking to their confidence in that, in their competency and their character um, and doing what's best. Great comments. All right. So I'm going to ask Joe to actually put this link in the chat for you. Um, this is actually a video of Dr. Amy Act, um, Acton from Ohio. Um, and we wanted you to, we want to be able to play the beginning of this clip, um, but it's not working very well on this platform, but I want you to just check it out later. Um, and you don't have to watch very much, just maybe a minute or two is enough because I want you to see how she communicates with people and how she demonstrates these skills um, and how she comes off when she's talking about things. She, when I watch it, I'm just amazed. She appeals directly to people. Um, she talks directly to people instead of in this professional speak sometimes um, that's off-putting for people. And I think the way she communicates and communicates transparency and things like that, and you can see her character, you can see her confidence, really makes you trust what she's saying. It's the best example I've seen about this. Um, so yeah, when you have some time later, please just um, take a look at that link and just watch that video for a minute or two and see um, what she has to say here. Yeah, and I like Jean, Jean's mentioned too that um, both Fauci and Cohen demonstrate authenticity. Yeah, and so think about when I said authenticity and, and Doug mentioned it earlier, you may have said, yeah, that's important. But yeah, when you think about it with examples like Fauci and Cohen, think about how important that authenticity is for believing in them and trusting their messages. So, um, of course, many of us are aware that Dr. Acton and many health officials have left their roles amid the pressure and culture of change. Um, even those who have received recognition and praise for their performance. So um, I think y'all know in Ohio, um, they have uh, their governor is a pretty conservative governor, um, but was very supportive of, of um, Amy Acton and, and the work that she was doing. Um, so we're not going to go into details about high stakes leadership today and really that courage piece and that moral leadership piece. Um, but as Doug stated earlier, we do have plans for developing some further um, modules this is kind of a primer, that's why we're calling this a primer. And we intend to have one on high stakes leadership, which focuses on challenges that public health officials face, um, for instance. So if you're interested, um, we do have an evaluation at the end of this. Um, and if you'd be interested in that type of course, please let us know so we can um, pursue that. So it's important to consider that there are different levels of crisis, right? So let's look at crisis in three general levels. So you can kind of think of level one. This is when maybe there's public embarrassment or the mission of an agency is threatened. Um, and I don't know if you can guess, I'm gonna go off script here. I don't know if y'all can see this, but our communications people at the Institute are really good. They make their own graphics. But I do believe this picture in this newspaper is Nancy Pelosi, who evidently is on one of your boards of health. Um, yeah, that was put together. Take a look at it anyway. It may be too small for you to see, but I'm pretty sure. I didn't know she was serving on, on a board of health, but evidently so. Um, but again, 
one is that public embarrassment and mission threat. So examples of this may be sexual harassment charges brought against a leader, um, maybe insensitive or racially charged statements made by a leader. We know about social media, how many things are coming out in social media along those lines right now. Maybe overaction taken by an organization that damages the environment in some way. Um, maybe an organizational um, effort that places profit over welfare, right? Um, or maybe some situation that's viewed as unethical, politically incorrect, or socially irresponsible. Um, these are the sorts of things that are kind of considered a level one crisis. And so when we think specifically about public health or healthcare agencies, any of these things, unfortunately, could certainly apply. But we also might want to think about things that are specific to us, like maybe media attention. If a board of health is having some infighting against county management or the board of county commissioners um, about governance of the, of the health department, perhaps, or maybe a report comes out about a hospital having unfair hiring practices. So certainly um, these sorts of level one crisis can affect our health departments as well. And then when you're escalating a little bit, is it kind of a level two crisis? And so that's a situation where there is personal injury of some sort, maybe some property loss, potential loss of life, potential for serious damage to an organization's reputation or a combination of these things is really considered this escalated um, level two. So again, for, pers for public health or healthcare, um, those also could apply, but it might also um, include media, media attention. We know this has happened in a couple of health departments where there's been a discovery of lack of follow-up testing on cancer screenings um, and that got taken up by the media or perhaps a safety report coming out from a hospital showing that they have a much higher rate than average of post-operative infections. So again, uh, situations that escalate a little bit more the crisis. And then at the top, you have level three. And that's really where there is loss of life. There's significant property damage, a perceived threat to the, to the very organization, um, infrastructure, or a combination of these. Um, and again, for public health and healthcare agencies, this might mean management of a large outbreak, for instance, or a hospital's financial failure. So again, just wanting to point out that there are certainly different levels of crisis. And I think um, everybody would probably give COVID a three. <laughs> No surprise there. And so I want to talk a little bit about emotions that people experience during a crisis. So earlier we talked a little bit about how um, one of the characteristics of a crisis is that it just doesn't affect physical things. It affects people's emotions and their behaviors and their actions. And there's all, all driven by how people are experiencing during a crisis and how that makes them feel and then act. And so we have to remember that crisis at any level, any of these one, two or three levels can have a human impact and can bring many emotions. And I don't need to tell you guys this. I think you guys are, are well aware that um, this COVID pandemic is not only stressful in public health because we're reacting and we're working in an emergency where we're having to help people who are having these emotions, but at the very same time, our own families are being impacted we're being impacted and we have those same emotions. So I'm sure you guys already see these in your agencies. But certainly um, all sorts of different types of emotions can show up in a crisis. Um, just a couple of them, loneliness, sadness, guilt, shock, disgust, horror, all these sorts of things. Hopefully things like empathy maybe, again, take, trying to take a positive spin on it. But as service workers in healthcare and public health, we, we feel a range of emotions during organizational crises because that crisis can affect us personally as well. And so this can mean that a range of emotions and exhibited behaviors based on how we do with the crisis personally and how we want to help in different ways and how we have to work to respond professionally can all get intermixed. Um, so it's really important to keep this in mind when you're responding because crisis leadership, of course, is not only about responding outwardly, so for public health to our communities um, and leading them through the pandemic, but it's also turning inwardly in how we're leading our organizations and our staff. So I want to hear if anybody was surprised by some of the reactions or some of the emotions of some people in their agencies or maybe colleagues. Um, were you surprised by any of those that you may have seen in the pandemic or throughout the past six months? give people a couple of minutes to think about it. 
or been the motion of the motions been what you kind of expected? Doug, do you have any examples from maybe past um, emergencies? Sure. And uh, situations where uh, we've had outbreaks that were ongoing. And so it's like that cycle of, and this is perhaps like a foodborne illness or even um, some other kind of chemical disease. And obviously not like a COVID situation, but one where it's connected like a shigalosis outbreak connected to child care centers where you you're working the arc. You think you've got it handled. You think you can let uh, people, uh, new, new people into the child care center. And then there's another outbreak associated with that facility. And that cycle continues. And I can only imagine in COVID where people may be going through that same cycle of you've got apprehension and then there's grief and then you've got shock and surprise and maybe then things for a day or so, perhaps in your community for a couple of days, things are not are not back to normal, not at all, but at least a little less active. But then it spikes and goes through that cycle again. And that, to me, can be very, very uh, impactful uh, to people. So that yeah. was an experience, certainly with shigalosis, that was in, an incredible situation. Yeah. So for a lot of crises, I think we think or we're used to, for instance, like you shared in an outbreak investigation, like hopefully we're just going to get through the crisis. It's not going to land. It's not going to go too long. We're going to stop transmission, for instance, and um, the crisis is going to be averted. But I think one thing to think about and why these emotions are so important during COVID is this is a really sustained response, more so than we've had in any public health response, um, at least since I've been in public health. Right. It's really sustained. And so emotions just continue and change and cycle. Yeah, and Samantha points out, no surprises, <laughs> no surprises that she's seen. Um, and Kathy says, yeah, not colleagues. She's not surprised by colleagues, but publicly the not denial has been unbelievable. And yeah, I think, Kathy, that's important. And I think what also kind of um, challenges our emotions right now as leaders in public health is that um, some of us sometimes have family and friends who um maybe don't have the same perspective we do or the same beliefs about protective measures and things like that. We may have family members who, you know, don't believe the science and that masks work or don't believe that COVID is as serious as it is. And I think, especially for us who work in public health and are so passionate about that, that that's really, a, it's, a, it's a challenge, even though these people don't mean it, it's a challenge to our very nature and our profession and our passion and what we do. Um, and that drives emotions too. Yeah. And so Margaret points out, she's been surprised by how challenging it's been for folks to adapt, adjust to new information. Right. Lots of us know what science is all about, right? It's about test testing and hypothesis generation and pivoting and trying to, th and, and getting to, um, you know, always changing. You never have the answer, right? But yeah, that's been, I think, tough, especially in the media to explain to people that science is evolving, right? And we're adjusting and adapting. And Gene points out that he's surprised by how the public health workforce keeps on going during a crisis, right? And I think we need to keep these emotions internalized and it's only afterward that we get, begin to process what it was like. Yeah, there's gonna be, I think we're experiencing emotions now, but um, yeah, you gotta wonder what it's gonna be like when it finally um, slows down a little bit. And Kathy points out, it reminds her of the emotions of 9-11 and how we continue to feel as the anniversary of those actions continue through time. Yeah, I agree with that. And I think a lot of us, um, even beyond the professional perspective, um, a lot of people now know somebody who's, who's passed from COVID or um, certainly those of you guys working the front lines, um, you're talking with people who have lost loved ones and things like that. And um, yeah, I agree with you, Kathy. I think it's going to affect us for a long time, and especially on anniversaries or when things are brought up. Yeah. And Pam points out that there's so many of us extremes of emotions, right? And a patient shows improvement. We celebrate as a team and then take a turn for the worst, right? And then you have to sustain what you're doing with that sadness. Absolutely. Yeah, and that we're not, as public health workers, immune um, from the effects of COVID. And we are sitting here trying to help people and help our communities when um, we're also facing, facing loss many times ourselves. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so this emotions piece is, is, is a big piece here. And so, again, just want to point out that um, emotions really, you don't want to think of them as, as positive or negative, right? It's the behaviors that they trigger 
that can be negative or positive. And so when we think about helping people as leaders with their emotions, that's what we're really trying to work towards is the behaviors. We're not telling people not to feel what they feel. They feel what they feel and they they have a right to that. Absolutely. But what we can work on is those behaviors um, that are triggered. And so leaders who understand this connection between emotion and behavior will be more effective during a crisis because they will understand how to meet the needs of people in the organization and so influence their behavior, right? And so that connection describes a sequence that starts with a crisis, right? We're starting with a crisis, and then that's going to result in an emotion to an answer to a threatened need, right? And then that's followed by a move to action and subsequent behavior. Leaders need to take emotions into consideration, both their own, of course, and others, because people in their organizations and on their teams and in their larger community behave in ways that are really consistent with their emotions. And so in a crisis, emotions can become, can become unbalanced and lead to behaviors that may be uncharacteristic for people, for instance. And a key to crisis leadership is kind of anticipating this chain of events and leading in such a way as to return balance to the organization. And so again, this is, um, we can talk about this topic all day long, and this goes back a little bit to, again, one of those sessions that we may have in the future about kind of self-care, but it's also about staff morale. Um, I can't even imagine what it's like on the front lines for you guys right now with staff morale. Um, it's, you know, it pales in comparison to the challenges I feel at UNC where I haven't seen in person any of my team members since March and we all work together on projects and we're in Zoom all day long. Um, that feels so foreign to me and so challenging um, morale wise, but certainly what you guys are experiencing uh, in this sustained response that just doesn't end and is hitting you at all ends is really uh, it's it's unparalleled. And I don't think it's anything we've seen before. Um, so, again, we think this morale piece and taking care of of yourself and being a big part of leadership. And again, if this is something that um, you would like further training on, please let us know in the evaluation at the end. So we're gonna shift, actually, let's see, it's 3.53. I'm gonna go through the next section. And since this is kind of a long presentation training, we're gonna take a short break after that. So if you can just hold tight for a little bit, we'll get through this next section really quick. So leadership is really about influencing others. We talked about that earlier, right? It's about influencing people. So let's talk about strategies to do that, kind of based upon the competencies and the skills we've already talked about. So there's really three key areas of influence most critical for crisis leadership. One is communication. So one of you guys brought that out in one of the earlier polls. Good job. Another one is clarity of vision and values. We know as an organization and with general leadership, you always have to have, you know, a clear mission and vision and values. But in a crisis, it's even more important when you're trying to influence people. And then lastly, caring for others. Very uh, kind of hardcore and formal. You don't think about caring for others being one of the three components. But really, when you're influencing people in a crisis, it is really important to be authentic um, and demonstrate care for others. Um, that's really the best way to build trust and, and influence people to do what, what you're asking them to do. So, yeah, let's talk a little bit about clarity of vision and values. So crisis leadership requires having a clear vision and value system. So that can either be your personal value system as a leader or it can be passed down and through your organization. Um, that can be communicated so that your direct reports, other leaders around you, and the public understands it, they feel ownership about it, they endorse it, and they have a clear vision. And it's really important for that clear vision and value systems to be a powerful influencing tool. It, it should be before, but also during and after a crisis. But clarity of vision is only effective if it's associated with a set of values that clarify what's important to the organization or field. So during a crisis, a leader can leverage a credible vision and value system and use both of these as a rallying point and as a way to provide stability to all who are rocked by events. And so when I think about this and I think about this rallying point, I think about how we um, in public health understand and communicate our value. I think we know our value, but we struggle with 
communicating it many times. And so I encourage you when you think about this clarity of vision to do a little bit more work on, on kind of public health messaging and how we um, how we message to others um, in other fields, but also our communities about the value of what we do. Um, I was just on a session um, before this with the De Beaumont Foundation, and they were talking about messaging the value of public health. And so definitely check that out. They've got a great poll, um, poll results that they did from a national survey about what issues um, resonate the most and things like that. And they have a new project called the Phrases Project, which really goes into um, how to message public health. And, and I'm sure Joe can put those um, web links in the chat for you. But if you haven't taken a look at those, take a look at those because that's really important. I think we we know and we're passionate about public health and what it's all about. And we can talk about it all day long, but that doesn't mean that people outside of our field and our communities and decision makers understand our talk with that. Um, and I'll plug Gene Matthews, who's here as well. Um, Gene also does some, some work on better messaging based on um, moral foundations and how to talk lots of times with decision makers in ways that resonate with them. Um, a lot of what we're doing is not, is not working. And so taking a different approach is important. So I'm sure Joe can throw up a, a thing for better messaging too. Um, but yeah, I think those are really important when we think about, about vi um, vision and, and, and mission. So is there anything, um, we'll open up in the chat in a little bit. Are there some ways that you think, um, maybe the state and the health and the state health department has demonstrated clarity and mission and vision and values throughout this or have you seen it in your health department or another health department how there's been a very clear vision and values that's kind of drove your response or have you seen cases where that hasn't been the case maybe and that's been a challenge Again, I'll let Doug chime in while people are, are typing in. And I, I would be interested, uh, Amy, if anyone wants to, to uh, articulate it, and that is um, we talk about this, I think about this at the local level, and that is that, that clear vision uh, and that those set of values. And I mentioned earlier when I, I spoke about the incident command system or the, the NIMS process, but having an, an EOC dealing with COVID and has your local health department, are, are they working with, are you working with, uh, your emergency services folks, and did you open up a joint EOC? Uh, to me, I, I use that not just as a structural uh, comment, but also about there's a clarity of vision and values there where public health and emergency services and, and the county government, and whether you're multi-county jurisdiction or not, are working together, kind of hand in glove, you know, hand in hand to address these issues. And so at that point, point you all you have that buy-in that this really is an issue we all know it is but I mean really truly working it together in a community I would really be interested to see if anyone wanted to comment on that um, because I think in, in this kind of situation particularly with the duration that that type of work supporting each other not just in the public health frame but across the different sectors of government and the community yeah yeah I think we've seen that you know in North Carolina if you've seen a lot of the, the governor's press conferences and Dr. Cohen's and Dr. Tilson's is that um, they acknowledge the importance of having a strong economy and getting our kids in schools and all these other things. But the mission of pandemic of this pandemic response, right, is to keep people health and healthy and, and safe. Right. That's that's the clear mission. And we're going to work on all these other things. But that I think that that's been very clear to me, both in what they say and in their actions. Yeah, and Kathy kind of talks about this. Yeah, the weekly local health department calls with Bart Benton and his team have been great and really demonstrated clarity of message as well as sharing information. Yeah, and Pamela, good point too. Vision and values can really drive difficult leadership decisions. Yeah, it gives you um, something to fall back on um, when you're making a you're making a decision that may be difficult or may not be taken by everybody um, as well as you would like, if you can uh, ground that decision in your clear vision and values, then it's a lot easier to do, right? And it really does ground your staff and, and why you're doing it that way. That's a very good point. Yeah. Any other last comments? All right. And again, I would just encourage you if you um, 
go back and see that that uh, video from Amy Acton. I think you'll see that there too. So another thing to keep in mind that is that as a crisis leader, you you must of course have this vision and know your values and your guiding principles. But in this early phase, it's also important to define for yourself and others what you want to happen. So in this kind of guiding principle oriented manner, you want to kind of plan backward to the present when you need to decide and do what you need to decide and do to move kind of in that direction. So you want to think about where you want to get and then work backwards um, to make sure you get there. Um, because the reason why is because the early phases of crisis response tend to bring the most action. And again, going back to that great presentation by Vaughn Upshaw um, that was related to this, yeah, these early phase phases are really critical. Um, and that's where, you, you, you know, sometimes you can't get back to. If you don't respond the right way in the beginning, it's going to follow you throughout the crisis. And so the more you can do to think about that, the better. And so this is kind of referring to the velocity, the speed at which um, the crisis moves in the beginning, right? until it's contained and you're in the aftermath and the recovery phase. So this is the really important time to know your guiding principles, to know these vision and values as a foundation for your decision making. So for instance, use an, ex use an example, every agency health department has kind of emergency preparedness planning documents, right? We've worked on those and they're helpful, but they're not of much use if you don't have values to guide that response, right? It's just words on paper, unless you have the leadership and the values and the, vis and the vision to implement them and make them happen. All right, so again, going back to this, this um, clarity of vision and values, the second part of this little triangle is communication. And so not surprising, right? I think when we talk about like what was missing from an emergency or what could be improved um, in an after action, I don't think I've ever been to one where communication was not pointed out, right? It can always go better. And so when you think about crisis leadership, though, it's really about your personal communication skills. So there are personal communication skills that leaders can sharpen, sharpen to make themselves more effective. So when you think about these, they're listed here. So think about clear and articulate verbal expression. You've got to think about tone of voice, choice of words and tempo, for instance. And again, I'm sorry we weren't able to show that Amy Acton clip because she does this so well and so gracefully. Um, she just she just has that manner of speaking. Um, and I think some of our public health leaders in the state do as well. But it's not only about knowing the things, but it's also about being able to state them in the right way. Communication also means careful listening. It's not just about talking. Listening that involves appropriate eye contact, responsive gestures not interrupting, we won't talk about the debate last night, not interrupting and repeating key points to ensure that people are understanding. And so again, this is going back to, um, I think we all know those people who not only talk a lot in a conversation, but even when you're talking, you can see in their brain that they're not really listening to you. They're thinking about their next comment to come in with, right? That is not, um, when we get back to the issue of authenticity, that is not an authentic way to communicate during a crisis. People see through that um, and they see that you're not listening. So careful listening that's authentic. Also appropriate body language is really important too. Um, you guys know what that's all about. And then when you're communicating and writing, having a very clear and concise and straightforward writing style is really important as well. So again, I would just encourage you to, to look back at that clip by, by Amy Acton and see an example of, of how this works really well. And I also point out really quickly in the chat that, um, yeah, I forgot about that, Jean. Yeah, so if you're interested in more about that, um, not only better messaging, but especially how to use better messaging in the COVID-19 um, environment, please take a look at, um, at the webinar, the free webinar that Jean's got listed. So personal communication skills, as we talked about, are also important in crisis leadership. But crisis communication is not only how well you listen in order to obtain your facts, but how well you speak openly and clearly with impacted stakeholders. So again, it's about not talking in riddles, um, saying you don't know when you don't know and that you'll get back to people, being authentic and clear and transparent and honest and genuine with people is really important 
um, when you're thinking about crisis communication. And of course, there are courses and courses in crisis communication and crisis communication would be one of the modules we add to this primer as well. If you're more interested in that or I think um, in a different session, Joe's already put up the link to the, the CERC work um, through CDC, but he can put that link in, in the chat too. Um, but a great resource on crisis and emergency risk communications from CDC is always a good manual to go back to. So we've talked about two sides of this triangle. Let's talk about the third, and that is caring for others. So as you guys know, we in public health, I think, you know, we certainly wouldn't have gone into this field if we didn't have a care for others. And that drives a lot of our work. And so caring is really a sincere interest and genuine concern for others that goes a really long way um, towards meeting the emotional needs of people experiencing a crisis. Um, caring during a crisis response is not really a feeling. It's a set of behaviors um, that elicit perceptions in people um, that you and your organization truly care. Um, I'm sure we've seen, um, you've seen after uh, hurricanes and different storms or emergencies, you've, had, you've seen officials from FEMA or others talking about response. And of course, everybody always says we care for people. Um, but I think you can tell when that's really genuine or not. And I think this is something where public health can really come forward in this situation because caring for others is what we do every single day. Um, and when we talk about caring being a sincere interest and a genuine concern, that is the core of what we are and what we do. So I think when we think about this kind of triangle of influencing others, this is a place that you already have strong skills in and, and really leverage. Think about leveraging these. Um, we in your crisis communications. This is something that we have a strong foundation in and that we should le leverage. And I will point out that leaders who ignore this kind of social and human element of leadership, they're not leading. They're managing a crisis. They're not leading a crisis. In order to lead a crisis and influence people, you really do have to have this caring piece and this empathy for people piece. Yep. Again, caring dur during a crisis um, is a set of corporate and personal behaviors that elicit perception. So even does it matter what you're trying to convey and what you personally feel It's about the perception that people have. And so when thinking about this, um, I'm always brought back to my all time favorite quote um, in the world. Um, and it's from Maya Angelou. Um, and I'm sure mo many of you have heard this before. Um, you can't make people feel right unless you show that you care. Um, so again, th this quote is, she said that people will forget what you said, people will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. And I think that's really important in the work we do. I think, uh, I would love for y'all to remember <laughs> what I'm saying in this training today and use it in the future. Um, I hope people remember work that I've done in the field, um, but I care more about how I've influenced others to work in our field, to care about others, all those other sorts of things. Um, as I've moved further and further in my career, this resonates with me more and more, um, that our work is really, truly important, but the impact we make on people and the way they feel and live their lives is, is, what, we, is what we honestly do. And that's the outcome we have every day. And so I think this really relates back to that caring piece. So with that, we're about, two thirds of the way through. So I think it's a good time maybe to take a five minute break. So Joe, maybe you can put in the chat that um, everybody can, can stay online however they wanna be, but we'll start back up at 4.15, if that's okay with everybody.
All right, it's 415, so I think we're gonna start back up. We're into the long rows now, right? It's 415. <laughs> I think normally in a non-COVID pandemic, we would be getting ready for like a reception with some wine and some posters and an auction. And instead y'all get to, to wind up with us talking about crisis leadership. So we appreciate uh, everybody who's sticking with us. Um, we'll go ahead and wrap this up. All right, so now we wanna kind of talk about, we've talked about kind of clarity of mission and values. And so let's talk about some true kind of guiding principles. Thank you, Kathy. Can y'all hear me now? Yes, thank you. I said some really, really good stuff. Okay, <laughs> appreciate that. So yeah, we're gonna talk about the guiding principles of crisis leadership. And so we talked a little bit about um, clarity of visions and values, but it's also important for you to kind of lead it with, with these guiding principles too. And so the first really is um, not only thinking about, but making sure that you're demonstrating that you consider the well-being of people to be the first priority. First and foremost is the well-being. And I think for those of us in public health, you know, this these guiding principles are very general to crisis leadership and in general. Um, but also, I think well-being of people first, it really, really couches it in public health, right? We're very used to putting that first with caring and compassion, right? We should not have taken a break. <laughs> that just messed everything up. All right, Doug, next time just do like this big hand waving thing. Okay. <laughs> All right. So again, so assuming appropriate responsibility for managing a crisis is really, is really important too. Nobody, and I think we know this when we've seen um, different leaders work during COVID, nobody wants to hear a leader passing the buck or saying, that's not my responsibility, or that's not my fault, right? It's really important to, to own up to these things and whatnot. And then another guiding principle is that we really have to address needs and concerns of all stakeholders in a timely manner. And again, I think this is something that, again, we can leverage kind of the roots of public health in. Um, and this is thinking about equity and the different types of community members we have and the historically marginalized um, and people with, with um, specific health concerns and other things, we think about these things in public health. And so addressing the needs of everybody in a timely manner is really important. And again, I think this resonates well with us. And another guiding principle for us is that always, all decisions and actions should be based on honesty, legal guidelines, and ethical principles. And again, um, I think we're gifted in public health. that This is what a lot of our practice is, is grounded in. So there's nothing new here. And then lastly, um, that you're available, you're visible, and you have open communication with all impacted parties, right? That you don't feel preferential to some and things like that. And um, that people feel like they can, they can talk to you. Um, I think it demonstrated um, wonderfully that Dr. Cohen made some time in her schedule to talk to us yesterday. Leaders being available, being visible, and having that open communication to everyone is really important. Yeah, and as, as Doug said, having that emotional intelligence, we joke about that term sometimes, but it's really important with crisis leadership. And so when I really look at these guiding principles, I think, hey, like we're doing pretty good in public health with this. This is like the core of what we do in many ways. So um, I'll, I'll just say that I don't think it's a stretch for us with crisis leadership. We should be doing it well. It really is couched in a lot of what we do. Um, so again, let's hope that you're back from break and, and ready to, to type on your keyboard. So 
what are your initial reactions when you see this list? Um, are there any that you see, are there any that resonate really strongly with you? Um, or are there any that you, anything that you don't see here that you think is important as a guiding principle for crisis leadership? Know thyself. You want to talk about that a little bit more, Doug? People are going to chime in, so I'll watch. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't want to be too verbose. But um, when I think about this list and, and, and crises, uh, I did mention emotional intelligence, yes. And I also think about that top bullet about well-being of people and caring and compassion. We're talking mm -hmm. about the well-being not only of the community we're serving, but maybe more internally the people we're working with who are working together to uh, address mm -hmm. this crisis. And I think it's important that we look out for one another and you look out for yourself as a leader because, uh, again, not wanting to fall back to that we want to fix things. We're in human services or public health. Right. I think sometimes people can go 100 miles an hour and not know that, boy, maybe mm -hmm. I need to slow down because uh, it, it's a long haul. And that's why we have delineations of duties. That's why we also have time frames. If you're working, as a lot of folks have in an EOC, you have you know, 12 hour mm -hmm. time frames because you need to be able to to rest and relax, to be able to come back at it. Uh, certainly in something like COVID, I know that it's sustained, it has been sustained and will continue to be. So I think it's, it's knowing yourself and knowing when you need to take that step back for a moment. Mm -hmm. Right. Good points. Any other comments? I've got quiet during the break. Maybe we have a poll coming up. I'll get people back in it. All right. And so when we talk about influencing stakeholders, we also need to consider the many different types of stakeholders in our relationship to them. And so crisis leadership involves the needs, emotions, and behaviors of people that we've talked about, but at many different levels of the organization. And we talked about this a little bit earlier. It's not just about us leading out to our communities and with other leaders um, in our areas, but it's also about leading within the organization. And so let's break that down a little bit. Um, so we can think of three main components. One is kind of peer relationships, and so maybe horizontal cohesion. So when you, if, for example, if we use the example of a leader of maybe a health director here, maybe other department heads, such as emergency management director, would be a horizontal relationship, correct? Two department heads, for instance. And then there's also relations between superiors and subordinates. So this is more of a vertical type of cohesion. So again, if maybe you're um, a health director, vertical-wise, um, I, not below you, but a subordinate would be your staff, the staff that you're leading, but you would also be leading up with your board of health chair, for instance, your county manager, maybe your health and human services director. And also there's relations towards the organization as a whole and kind of this organizational cohesion. So again, think about that as kind of other colleagues you work with. So if, again, if you're a health director, other local, state, federal, public health key partners and leaders, um, would be part of the, that bigger organizational type relationship. But additionally, there's also the relationship to the whole community. And so that's relations of the individual and the organization with society and culture in general. So this is you, both yourself as a leader, but also your health department being a leader in COVID response out to your community. And so while why thinking about these um, this cohesion piece and these different levels is important is because remember we talked earlier about it's important to be open and responsive and communicate with all stakeholders right in all levels when you're doing crisis leadership you're having to focus in so many different ways um, and we just wanted to make sure that that was clear so um, we were going to go into breakout rooms, groups, but we can't do that in this session. So instead, um, I'm just going to ask you um, to put in the chat, and I swear this time I'm going to stay quiet until y'all do it. <laughs> um, what opportunities do you see could result from the COVID-19 crisis response? So remember earlier I talked about how there certainly can be negative um, emotions and feelings, but also consequences of a crisis. Um, but there could also be some positives. So I want to encourage you to think about what opportunities may come out as far as crisis leadership from our past, our present, and maybe our future COVID-19 response. Think about that for a minute. Put some 
some short ideas in the chat. Yeah, Samantha, I love that. Yes, yeah. Samantha says, I believe agencies and individuals, we've become more creative in how we do our work. We have to, right? We've kind of been forced into that to be innovative and creative because the solutions maybe we tried in the past haven't worked in the past and aren't working now. Yeah, I think that's great. Enhanced relationships with community um, such as business. Yes, yeah, so and maybe new partners that we're starting to work with. Pam brings up team cohesion. Yeah, so even though morale may be really challenging right now, think about how much it has brought your team together, right? And also, hopefully, there's more public knowledge about public health and the value of what we do out there. Um, new partners, clarification of processes and procedures, right? Um, no time like the present to dust off those emergency preparedness plans and make them work. Yeah, and Kathy talks about long-term relationships between divisions and organizations that may have not been there before, right? Yeah, you're interacting more than before. You can see the value of each other. Yeah, great points. Excellent. Yeah, I think about, um, you know, in the, in the beginning of the, of the pandemic too, that um, the recognition that, um, that we were seeing disparities in, in COVID, um, both with deaths, but also in ability um, and access for testing and things like that. And Certainly that was a negative, but then it's been so wonderful to see, um, we certainly haven't solved the problem, but it's been wonderful to see some of the initiatives that are not only led by public health, but led by some other community organizations too, in Latinx communities and, and others um, to really improve access of testing and things like that, I think has been um, a great opportunity that's come out of, out of this response and this crisis. Yeah, excellent. All right, so we're gonna talk briefly about kind of phases. So we talked earlier about types of crisis, like from one to three. So now we're gonna talk about kind of general phases of a crisis response. And again, we're just gonna go over the over the kind of the a basic level overview today. Um, there certainly could be another module about phases. Um, so this is gonna be a kind of a, a, a brief flyby. So I want to remind everybody, and this is, should not be a surprise at all, that crisis response is certainly a team strategy, right? You're not leading alone. It may feel like that way at times, um, but it certainly takes more than just you um, to lead your organization, especially during a crisis. And so just to go over really briefly, the six phases of crisis response are, and you can think about COVID and think about when this happened with you, but notification and activation. So with COVID, maybe the crisis was what, last February? We started hearing um, and started thinking about the potential for a pandemic, certainly. Two is fact finding. So absolutely, when, that, when the pandemic first started, we um, certainly, CDC and others and local public health ramped up surveillance activities um, and things like that and started doing science around using masks and all sorts of things. Decision making, we've talked about that a couple of times. A certain phase of, of the crisis, you're definitely going to start having to make decisions based on some of that fact finding, right? And then prioritizing. You have to start prioritizing. There's, You guys know there's never enough hours in the day to do everything you have to do with your COVID response. So you have to prioritize the tasks um, and the efforts that are being done. Then you have to implement those. And then at some point, you have to do a purposeful de-escalation. Um, and I think I saw Rod join earlier, Rod Jenkins from Durham, um, but I had a conversation with him the other day about how, yes, we're so hyped about COVID response, but at some point we've got to step back and, and manage that response, but also de-escalate some point to get back to a normal, um, to, to return to our normal operations and also manage that because this is such a sustained crisis. And so when I see these six phases, again, like a lot of things, this is, does not always have to be sequential. In general, this is. And then there's times where you're going to go back and forth, right? This is a sustained response. It's not pretty from one to six. And you may jump back from three back to one because of the nature of the outbreak and things like that as well. So just really quick about um, notification. So there are three levels of notification that can be kind of um, thought about with organizational crisis management. Um, information, so that's for like team members only, right? And that's kind of to breed familiarity, to get people kind of pumped up and ready. 
alerts or when a potential crisis is certainly looming. And then this kind of respond and activate is when, um, you know, there's the authority to kind of mo mobilize work and things like that. And really the point of this notification phase, and, and here we're talking more about kind of the organization, right? How you're working with your organization and leading your organization through the crisis is really to get your team members and resources notified, assembled, briefs. You guys can probably think back to February and March and kind of what you were doing as a health department during this time. And the second phase is fact finding. And so while you have to make immediate decisions and take actions, the crisis fact pattern will most likely be incomplete and will contain even wrong information at times. Um, so you're always going to have this mix of accurate, inaccurate and missing information during a crisis. Um, and I think the challenge here is um, I'm an epidemiologist by training. I want tons of information. I want tons of data at my fingertips to make a decision. Um, that's been what I've been trained to do. Um, but I, I worked in emergency preparedness at a local health department and state health department years ago. Um, and I had to put that to the side. I mean, that, that was going back to my tactical life and that task finding. But in an emergency, you really have to become more comfortable with getting the information you can, but understanding that it's not going to be perfect, but that you have what you have. Um, and trying to put together this fact pattern and understand where your gaps are and where your information may not be the best and getting a good kind of um, understanding and management of that information. And so um, maybe you can put in the chat and think about this, but I know there's times in the past six months where during the COVID response, there was misinformation, for instance, circulating in your community. Um, and a lot of that um, I've seen in a couple of people's posts was, you know, from social media, maybe your health department put up a post um, and people responded to that. Um, and so what are ways that, that, that you kind of address this or how do you deal with that sort of information? The, you know, I think we could go on and on about misinformation during this pandemic um, and how that's affected us. Um, but does anybody have a specific example where there's really misinformation rampant in your, in your community? And again, I'll, I'll kind of punt to Doug while people are typing. Um, any past outbreaks or emergencies, Doug, where that information really kind of impacted your department's ability to put all the facts and information together? There was there were a few, but one I can think of, and I'll I'll watch the chat too. Um, yeah. But yes, uh, thinking about influenza over the years, and as we know that the, we're in flu season again on, on the cusp of it, some years are much more um, much more impactful than others. And I recall uh, some of my uh, colleagues uh, from local days will remember that we had uh, a pretty significant flu season some years ago, and it impacted not only those who are normally impacted by influenza, people over 65, compromised immune systems, and so forth, but actually younger people who um, who were relatively healthy and um, were not only ill, but but un unfortunately passed away. And with the, the utiliz utilization of social media and the media who uses social media, we had lots of people respond to our posts and our information about flu shots and feeling that we were covering up information about actual influenza impact and deaths. And um, you have to address those issues while still trying to get out those very important messages mm -hmm. about flu. Uh, and it became very taxing in the organization because it continued and you want to engage people and answer their questions. You don't want to shut them off in social media right out of the gate because then you're seen as trying to put the barriers up at the same time, you have to make decisions. And I'm sure our colleagues uh, in this session have had to do that to some degree with COVID, because if you continue that back and forth in a social media framework, it, it's a, a continual wheel. And we we uh, really did find that with, a, again, that particularly severe flu season some years ago. Yeah, that's a great example. And it's, I think it's, it's always a delicate balance, but I mean, I think even when there's misinformation out there and people, challenging about the, the, the science and the facts, we can't just ignore that, right? People's perceptions and the voice that they can have in social media um, is really important. And when we are putting together the facts and putting together our information to make decisions, people's perceptions, right or wrong, are really important um, as part of that and have to be kept in mind, whether we like it or not. Yeah. All right. 
So decision making, this is kind of phase three, and this one's really, really important. And we talked about this earlier, but decisions during crisis will need to be made with partial information um, throughout the crisis response. Timeliness is equally as important as doing the right things in a timely response. Effective decision making comes from information received, prudent judgment, calculated risk taking, the courage to take action in uncertain times, and anticipation of stakeholder reactions. So from a strategic standpoint, your decision making should be consistently in, in accord with, again, going back to that clarity of vision and your values on how best to handle the crisis. So I think the challenge here is that, again, we would like to have as much information as possible to make a decision, but in crisis, we don't. And you have to use what information you have, the judgment and the confidence you have in your, in your abilities um, as a leader and your knowledge of public health. You have to be willing to take a little bit of risk um, and assume the consequences for that and have that courage to take action in a time that's certainly uncertain and it may not feel totally comfortable to do so. And you also have to make that decision thinking about, thinking ahead about what reactions to that decision are gonna be and having the courage to still make that decision no matter what, but being able to anticipate that. Um, and I think we, we talked about that a little bit earlier when we thought about um, North Carolina's leaders' responses with the phases and things like that. You know they anticipated that they were gonna get backlash, but they were steadfast um, in their decision. And so what we're gonna do now uh, yeah. So I think making decisions without full information is challenging for a lot of us. Um, we're always talked about data informed decision making and evidence based practice and things like that. And I think in public health, we're, we're really drilled into having the facts and all the information to make a decision. So would really like to see if you guys can go to the poll again, um, how comfortable you kind of feel um with making decisions without full information so think about kind of how you feel about it and rank yourself from one to ten one being not at all comfortable and ten being totally comfortable and let's see what we have coming in i think what this is showing is it's tough right we don't have anybody above seven look at that So I think we all have to acknowledge that it's a really uncomfortable thing, right? No matter how much experience you have as a leader or in public health, making a decision without full information in a crisis is a challenge for us. And it's something we really, you know, I talked about some of the, the foundations of public health that make crisis leadership maybe easier, easier for us to, to leverage. Um, I think this one is one we have to, we have to work harder towards. Um, to taking action on. Yeah, so you can see where most of us feel. Pretty, pretty uncomfortable, somewhat uncomfortable, right in the middle there. Yeah, great. Okay. So let's talk um, a little bit more about decision making. So I just want to show you really quickly one model that you can use for decision making. Um, it's called the SIPD model. Um, you've got to love an acronym. We have to have an acronym. So um, this model actually comes from um, driving. I don't know if any of you have any um, young drivers at home right now who are just going through driver's ed or anything, but this is actually the model that's used with driving. Um, and so we'll go, we'll go through these really quickly. Um, so SCAN really starts with this situational awareness, right? Getting as many facts as possible, um, knowing that you don't have enough time to do so, and being prepared um, to implement decisions with what you do know. And so, again, you can kind of think about this with, with driving, right? Um, driving down the highway on the interstate, right? And you're, to you're always scanning. You're always scanning to see what's happening, to see if there's any threats going on, right? And the second is identify. So that's identify problem areas. And so, again, if you think about this with driving, you have your scope of vision and maybe you see somebody, you know, uh, 500 yards ahead of you who's kind of in the, in the swerving into the across the double lines, right? So that's identifying problems. And then predict. Um, the next step is to predict where the various problem areas may be headed. 
Um, so this is kind of that, that idea of looking around a quarter, right? And doing some anticipation about what's about to, to occur. And that's really an important trait of um, strategic crisis leadership. Kind of that anticipation and thinking about what's coming. And then as we've talked about making a decision, um, you have to decide, you have to pay attention to um, what's happening and how facts are presenting to you and how they're changing, and then make a decision about how to implement um, any actions that you need to take. And again, thinking about that with driving, you see that person crossing the crossing the line, what are you gonna do? Are you gonna hit the, hit the horn? Are you gonna swerve out of the way? You gotta make a decision about what you're gonna do. And then act, the last step, of course, is to execute. Um, and execute decisively, make that decision for better or worse, make the decision and then pivot after. So as a general rule, you wanna execute actions that serve the greater good of the organization um, and then and kind of mitigate fear-based behaviors, right? And so that's just one model you can use. Um, it's kind of a kind of a quick one to think through um, when we kind of want to work more on that decision making um, thing that I think we have to work a little bit more towards as public health leaders. But this is really important too. Always remember that you may make the wrong decision. In a crisis, I can't even think of how many decisions have been made, for instance, by one health director over the past six months. So many decisions. It is totally understandable with the pressures, with the lack of information, that some wrong decisions are going to be made along the way. The important thing to do is to pivot from that and then do the next right thing, right? Um, again, a, a quote from Don Meyer, do the next right thing. If you didn't do it this time, do it the next time. So a couple of issues involved with decision making. So still focusing on decision making and how to kind of sharpen our toolbox with these as public health um, crisis leaders. One is to kind of um, execute high quality and timely decisions during unexpected situations. Um, you have to remember that you've got a lot of personal stress going on. We've talked about the sustained response to COVID, that you're not only helping lead your community, but you're leading your organization and your team, and you have all this going on in your personal life as well. Also, there's high consequences. Absolutely, there's high consequences with many decisions that are having to be made in public health right now with COVID. Um, whether to implement, you know, thinking at the state level, um, a lot of governor's executive orders and things like that, um, doing the right thing for health and safety has consequences on economy and other things like this. So obviously high consequence. And we've talked about this before, but there's always going to be inadequate information when you're making a decision. You don't have enough facts. The facts are changing. Perceptions out there are different than fact many times. Always, you're not going to have enough time. We've talked about that. And of course, as you know, every decision you make is going to be held to close scrutiny by all those around you, not only decision makers, but the community and everybody else. And now with social media and everything, of course, um, uh, leaders are, are highly visible as well. And then lastly, and, and unfortunately, we've seen this during the pandemic, blame and outrage directed towards the organization and, ma and managers, whether you're doing the right thing and, and implementing measures that are important um, or not, many times you get blame and outrage directed at you, um, unfortunately. And so I want to pull, point out um, one more tool for decision making, and that's called the 4070 rule. And I don't know if any of you guys have heard about this before. Um, but yeah, when I struggle with thinking about, oh, I don't have enough information to make a decision. When do I have enough information? Like, you know, when I hear this at first, like make a decision without the right. Of, well, well, how much? Like how, how much information until I need to do that? And so Colin Powell actually um, came up with this 4070 rule for crisis decision making. And he says that you don't take action until you have enough information to give you at least a 40 percent chance of being right. But he adds, don't wait until you're 100 percent sure because you'll always be late at that point. So once you have 40 to 70 percent of the information in a high velocity situation, remember we talked about that in a crisis, always moving very fast, especially at the beginning. It's best to implement with your gut level decision when you think you're in that kind of 40 to 70 percent area. So, again, just to kind of reiterate this, don't take action until you have a 40 percent chance of being right. Do not wait until 100 percent. Right. Because you're going to be too late to make a decision. Right. 
So again, 100% too late. Don't get to that point. Although we'd like to get to that point. <laughs> and so an example of crisis leadership decision making is when New Zealand's prime minister, for instance, would ramp up her response. They ramped up their response when they still only had 52 cases in the country. Um, and so, you know, that's an example of not getting to the 100 percent, not getting to the point where they're so overburdened that response at that point horses out of the barn. But, you know, making a decision when they felt like they had enough um, to move forward. And so if I were you and I was in the audience, I would still be questioning a little bit this decision making because it's so difficult. And so I do want to acknowledge that crisis decision making is really a balancing act, right? It's about gathering enough of that information to get a general mental picture of what's going on analyzing the facts to identify the problems, the opportunities, and what points you can leverage, 